Hi everybody, this is Joanne, Science Goddess on Twitter, and one of your hosts for Read Science, along with Jeff Schomeyer, who is sitting over there near Washington, DC. And uh, today's guest is Sabina Hassenfelder, who is in Germany. And uh, we are going to talk about her book, Lost in Math, How Beauty Leads Physics Astray. Very interesting book, much more fun than I thought a book that says math on the cover would be. So, um, Jeff, you're slowly converting me. <laughs> and Sabine, welcome to the show. Hi. <laughs> We're glad to have you. Oh, let me let me tell people about Sabina. So, okay. I'm just reading this short thing from from your publisher. It says Sabina Hassenfelder is a research fellow at the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies and the author of the popular physics blog Back Reaction. She has written for New Scientist, Scientific American, and NOVA, and also the New York Times. That was just a couple weeks ago. You had a, um, an article, an opinion piece there. And uh, so I've seen people say, people love you or hate you, I see. <laughs> There's nothing in between. <laughs> All, right. All right, Jeff, you want to go ahead? OK, Sabina, the, the subtitle of your book is How Beauty Leads Physics Astray. And I'm steeped in physics. I was brought up that way. And this makes perfect sense to me. And I'm wondering if it's not, not for bad, but if it's a provocative title for the reader who isn't the physicist, who wonders what in the world you're talking about when you say beauty. And so it may be a little obvious, but I wondered if we could start just sort of getting an idea what beauty means when it comes to talking about physical theories and things. And this is largely in the, the domain of, quote, theories of everything, or as, as you have called it, uh, foundational physics, the things that talk about uh, the nature of the world at its smallest or biggest and combining the forces that we know about in nature. What, what, how, how would you characterize beauty in, in a theory like that? So the book is really not about my personal opinion of what is beautiful, but uh, of what it has come to count as beautiful um, in those areas that I, as you say, summarize as the foundations of physics. So that are those areas that are concerned with the, with the big questions. What is matter made of? Uh, what is space? What is time? How did the universe begin? Uh, that kind of stuff. And uh, for the book, I went around and uh, I spoke with a lot of people, uh, some of which uh, I have interviewed and those interviews are in the book, but I spoke to many more people. And it's interesting that they largely agree on what makes a theory beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it's a very narrow sense of beauty, I would say. Um, that focuses on three notions. Uh, the first one is simplicity, and then there is naturalness, and then there's a vague notion of elegance. Mm -hmm. And I, I go through these in the book. If you want, I can briefly summarize that. Yes, yeah. although, uh, yeah, but I'm interested because I was thinking about it, and I'm wondering where my own sense of, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about comes from. And when you mention elegance, I'm thinking there's some sense of, and the economy particularly, that here you have a theory that seems to have emergent properties that you didn't expect from rather simple statements. But yeah, maybe a little summary just to just to get started. Yes, so um, yeah, um, that that's actually something that people often name uh, those, those surprising things that come out. Um, but um, yeah, so simplicity is probably the most obvious criterion of beauty. Um, and I always have to stress that I'm not talking about uh, comparative beauty. So it's not relative mm -hmm. uh, simplicity, I mean. Uh, so it's not uh, Occam's razor that I'm talking about. So th this is a good scientific criterion. I'm talking about absolute simplicity, where you want to have a theory that is simple, period. Um, and the, the laws of nature that we have them right now are just not simple enough for most physicists' taste. Uh, an obvious example for this are uh, the three interactions in the standard model of particle physics. Uh, physicists would rather have only one because that would be simpler. So that, that's absolute simplicity. Um, then there is naturalness. Uh, naturalness, uh, people who don't have a background in physics find that the, the most complicated of those three criteria. It basically means that if you have a theory that is formulated in mathematics 
and it contains numbers, just mm -hmm. pure numbers without units, then those numbers should be about one. They should not be very large, they should not be very small, they should be just right, kind of. Uh, and if a theory um, has this property, it's called natural. Um, so so I, I should put a fine print here. So this is a general notion of naturalness. In high energy particle physics, there's a more specific notion that's called technical naturalness, which says that sometimes small numbers are okay, provided <laughs> that you have an explanation for why they are small. Mm -hmm. And an explanation can be, for example, a, a symmetry. A supersymmetry is an example of that. And then there's the third criterion of naturalness, which is elegance, uh, which is what you were uh, getting at, um, that basically says that, um, yes, yeah, simplicity is all well and fine, but you don't want it to be too simple because that would be boring. Uh, you also want uh, to have some surprising insights that come out of your theory. Um, there's the uh, philosopher Richard David uh, has called this uh, unexpected explanatory closure. <laughs> that, 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 that sounds very impressive. I would call it the aha moment. Yes. Um, yeah. So um, other people have put it to me as uh, surprising connections uh, or some, something like that. A thing, and, uh, I, I, oh, the phrase that came to my mind was uh, we in my world, we would see uh, would you get would you get something just in the right place? Things just fall out. Yeah, and in some yeah, sense, it's like, oh, look, and suddenly these uh, these uh, magi magical flowers sort of start to grow, and and you get these things, and you feel like you're there. But then, the the sense of uh, simplicity is a mathematician's simplicity or the physicist's simplicity, because not a lot of people would find uh, tensor calculus particularly simple when it comes to uh, general relativity, okay. and yet there is a simplicity once you finally get there to to Einstein's equation. Yes, that's right. So this simplicity aspect very strongly depends on the knowledge that you bring already. Um, mm -hmm. I guess most people today would say uh, that general relativity is a very simple theory. But uh, of course, uh, that's only so if you already know differential geometry, <laughs> right? Yes. But I've, I felt like at one point, I think it was still early before I read uh, a great many of the interviews uh, that you did, but I found myself likening it to uh, looking for how to set up uh, geometry with a sort of minimal set of the simplest axioms you could find. It seemed to have a similar sort of idea. You'd like to feel like there are the fewest assumptions that you get, maybe not the fewest assumptions, that you get the most for the least input in a way. Uh, lurks behind that for me. It's like, oh, look, all I have to do is write this simple thing and I can generate this complexity, uh, fullness of, of results. Well, I would say that this is something which you generally aspire to in science, that from all the possible explanations for your data, you take the simplest one. Um, but yeah. in the foundations of physics, it's more than this because um, people are not just satisfied with a the theory that is as simple as it can possibly be to describe what we already have observed, but they want something that is just simple, period. Yes. Like, like a string theory is maybe a good example for this. So it has this very, very simple core idea. Everything is made of strings. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then you see where you get from there and um, uh, the hope is that you basically get everything out of uh, this one single idea. Now when you said the, the, there's one additional thing you expect from your beautiful theories, being an experimentalist, I was so hoping you would say you expect verifiable predictions. Uh, and I think later we're going to circle back and talk about anti-empiricism and, and those sorts of things. but. I think I should stop talking for a minute because I wanted to hear what Joanne thought about what what beauty looks like and whether you have uh, similar things in, in life sciences that, that strike you that way. Yeah, well, I don't think they're quite as uh, fleshed out as what has been done in physics. Luckily, I've read a few books on quantum uh, physics and this, uh, the concept of symmetry and supersymmetry, right? So for biologists, it's, it's a much different concept, right? It's what most people think of as symmetry, that both sides are the same in a mirror, you know, a mirror image of each other. So we, we um, yeah, it's, it's a very different idea in biology. So I think, um, I, you know, I did appreciate uh, Sabina's book to uh, help explain this more. I guess what I was drawn to more in the book 
was the fact that it reminded me a little bit of Lee Smolin's book, The Trouble with Physics. Mm. And I don't know if you've ever read that book, Sabina, but uh, you know, it, it's talking about the same, the same idea that science has changed a lot, but scientists haven't changed along with it. You know, that the, the, the demands we're making or the things we think can happen, we're, we're not pursuing them in the right way. So I'd be happy to hear you speak on that like, you know, how physics is uh, changing, but we're not, the physicists keep holding on to their old ideas instead of trying to move forward. Yeah, so uh, Lee's book is uh, focused on string theory, um, right? Whereas mm -hmm. I don't really have all that much to say about string theory. Mm -hmm. I already told you before we were online that um, I, I'm not string theorist's mm -hmm. biggest critic. I actually do think it has good motivations. Um, I just don't buy into this theory of everything uh, story. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so the 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 underlying bigger theme of the book, you know, below this beauty level um, is that um, the scientific communities have seen a lot of changes in the last decades. And not only because they've grown so much, uh, that, that's the obvious thing, we have more scientists today than ever before and not only in, in absolute numbers but also in relative numbers compared to um, the general population increase um, and also the connectivity among the people has definitely gotten um, better and we have much more public exposure uh, we have shorter and shorter contracts uh, fewer people on tenure and those are all changes that the communities really have not adapted to and I think they um, amplify the problems that can come from uh, social and cognitive biases that, that I go on about uh, to some mm -hmm. extent in the book. And this obsession with beauty is just an example of a cognitive bias that uh, can become uh, dominant in a community because uh, bad methodologies do not correct. You are the, the physicist who, the theorist who searches for beauty and uses this to guide his or her uh, belief about what is the, you know, the perfect theory among choices comes from someplace. But you also, uh, you also have some nice talking about how surely the sense of beauty changes and then get to the question of, do we th see things that are beautiful and think those are correct? Or have we seen theories that work well and those are the ones that become beautiful for us that there's the 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 beauty it always feels absolute but it's not yes it's pretty obvious if you look at the history of physics that uh, the ideals of beauty have just changed over time uh, the the best known example are probably uh, circular orbits right that was the mm -hmm. thing uh, it had to be on a circle and if not a circle then it was a circle around a circle uh, so now today we know it's really ellipses and no one thinks that's ugly, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I would be surprised if any astronomer would argue that way. Uh, there are other cases where, where this has happened or where it has just become uh, irrelevant. Um, like uh, quantum mechanics is, is maybe an example. Um, uh, people have complained that it's supposedly ugly ever since it was conceived, uh, mm -hmm. but it works and we still mm -hmm. use it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then there's, uh, for example, the um, the idea that the universe is eternally unchanging. Uh, it's just uh, the same way that it has ever been and it will ever be this way. Uh, this went out the window uh, with Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. Mm -hmm. And at the time that this became clear that uh, in Einstein's theory, the universe has to be uh, expanding. Uh, people thought it was ugly. They, they, wanted, they wanted their eternally unchanging universe back. Uh, but uh, I think if you were to ask uh, astronomers uh, today, they would probably, you know, argue that it's much more beautiful to have a universe that evolves and that changes over time. <laughs> And, that, so, and and uh, sorry, before I forget about yeah. this, I because I, I go to length to stress in my book that this is not an idea that I've come up with, but uh, that this idea that these uh, ideas of beauty change uh, with scientific revolutions goes back to uh, a philosopher by name, Meg Alistair, who has written a book about it. It's called uh, Beauty and Revolution uh, mm -hmm. in, in Science or something like that. Yeah. And maybe we should be clear here that that talking about beauty in physical theory for these foundational problems and some others is not um, a new way of describing it. The physicists themselves say, this is beautiful. They recognize that this is what they're talking about, even if they don't uh, 
know the source of what their uh, aesthetic judgment is or something. They talk about their equations being beautiful. Dirac would say, I know this, this equation must be correct because it is so beautiful. Uh, so this is, this is part of their dialectic. This is how they talk about it already. It, so this it is just, it works oh. terribly badly. <laughs> yes. Well, and, and that's where you started or one of your uh, motivations from your preface is to say, you feel like the physics has led astray uh, perhaps because of this search for beauty and that there have been what you call failures. And indeed, the Large Hadron Collider uh, is enormous and interesting, and, but it has not yet uh, ended the universe and all it's found is the Higgs boson. Astrophysics, uh, you say dark matter is something, who knows, it's just most of the universe. Cosmology says dark energy is, we don't really know, but it's most of the universe. And suddenly it looks like, boy, we're missing a lot. And then you say, ha ha, this is because people look for beautiful things. Um, yeah, roughly speaking. So um, <laughs> maybe I should, yeah, it's a little bit more complicated than that because um, you see, you, you saw that people um, use um, beauty um, as a guide that has developed from experience, uh, basically. So, so they look at an equation and then they say, oh, I recognize this is beautiful, it should be true. And, um, you know, I, I don't know why they would rely on something like that. doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, but uh, it is certainly something that you can do and that you can try. And uh, it makes a lot of sense that if you have criteria of beauty that have worked in the past, like, for example, for the development of the standard model where symmetries uh, play a big role and also unification um, is, is, is an example for this, that you would try to use it again. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, what physicists have done starting in the 1980s, uh, you know, once, the once they had the standard model. And that is what led to those predictions of new particles, like supersymmetric particles that were still looking for the, those specific types of dark matter particles, the WIMPs and the axions, uh, and also, um, you know, the dark energy fields and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And it did not work. Mm -hmm. And now um, this is where things start going wrong. It's if you use a method that does not work, but you don't learn the lesson. Instead, what has happened is that uh, theoretical physicists have become really good at uh, amending their theories yeah. so that they evade the experimental constraints and they're still using the same methods uh, for theory development. And as you just um, said, um, people have made all those predictions for the Large Hadron Collider, which has not seen anything uh, besides the Higgs boson. And um, those were all predictions that were based on certain ideals of beauty and particular um, naturalness that we already talked mm -hmm. about. But this gets us then to a looming right here behind what you're saying is a big uh, philosophical or, or uh, well, a metaphysical problem for physics of you create these beautiful theories for things and say, look, this is beautiful and it explains everything, but I can find no experimental tests for you to perform. But this is so beautiful, it must be correct. And I'm an old school experimentalist who says, I don't know, I think I'm maybe with you on where I was reading in your book that the, uh, the new hints of anti-empiricism that maybe experiments aren't necessary to verify these theories, you know, is, uh, is being challenged. Well, that's a pretty scary thought. Yes, that's, so that's a pretty scary trend. I agree with that. Um, I would at least at this point still say that most of the people in the field uh, would not go that far. Mm -hmm. um, they actually do think that eventually they will be able to make some predictions and, and something will come out of it. Um, I don't really believe it because those theories can be adapted so flexibly. They are basically unpredictive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we've, we've seen theories at the beginning of the, of the 20th century. Uh, these are not ancient examples. These are still, you know, almost within lifetime of, of uh, not being able to find testable predictions at the time, but they later became testable. So there's always a bit of hope as long as we don't say, ah, we don't need them, uh, that, that we may be able to find some ways to test things empirically. But I don't know. Doing without yeah, it, maybe, 
maybe it's just the people who enjoy the headlines of being controversial who say, ah, maybe we don't need to experiment anyway, and they get they get their moment of fame. Well, that's one of the reasons why uh, I say I'm not uh, opposed to the idea of pursuing string theory. I mean, maybe it will take a little bit more time until they uh, mm -hmm. come up with predictions, uh, as long as uh, I could see some indication that at least they're trying. And sometimes I'm, I'm not all that sure about it. There seems to be a large fraction of people who are um, very you know, they, they are just fine with uh, producing papers that have no relevance uh, to describe the world whatsoever. And, and that's kind of a trend that worries me. Um, it, it's just not science anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Um, Is that new though? Are there, there have there, or have there always been groups who develop mathematical things and, and do stuff sort of at the edges just, and that's part of what goes along with a big so well, there, there have some, certainly the always been program. people who have been, yeah, sorry, who have who have been more interested in in the mathematics. Um, and as long as there, there are a few people uh, who do that, uh, that's all fine. There's also, um, and I, I always have to stress with, there's a whole discipline that's called mathematical physics, mm -hmm. um, which is concerned with that. But that's a part of mathematics. It's not a part of physics. Um, okay, so, so those people are really, they're more concerned with understanding the theories that physicists uh, use than rather with describing observations. And, and so, um, so it's, a, it's a different game, uh, basically. Um, I, I do think that it has become much worse uh, in the last uh, decades because um, we have had this long series of null results that has le left theorists without any guidance from mm -hmm. experiment. So as long as you have regularly evidence of new phenomena that uh, you need to describe with your theories, you cannot stray too far into the forest of mathematics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but um, if you have a long period in which there is no new data or you know I, I should not say no new data because we have a lot of new data yeah, it's just that th this data always uh confirms the theories that we already have so the theorists have nothing to go on with mm -hmm. um so, so they're just wildly speculating and then they they do a lot of things that that don't make a terrible sense let me put it that way is the is the connection between theory and experiment getting farther apart of of uh, theory sort of uh, doing a next step and saying this can be tested and the experiment says yes this is fine and this direction looks interesting and theorists develop it and find new things say yes this is still interesting and then something unexpected maybe uh, there seems to be, well some of the things you described seem to have a much bigger disconnect uh, of that feedback system of uh, how to decide what to look at look for next uh, I, I think what you say is probably true that um, you have this disconnect between the theorists and the experimentalists that is getting larger, but I uh, am, am guessing that this is a general um, part of the trend towards more specialization. It mm -hmm. just comes with having larger communities. At some point, they will start falling apart. So uh, I don't think that that's a special disease uh, of this particular uh, part of science. It, it can cause problems, though, um, because you have, um, so if you have only people who, who do this increasing specialization, um, you, you don't have a connection between the different communities. And um, so I, I actually do think in particle physics, it's not that big of a problem. Um, mm -hmm. They uh, they communicate quite well with each other, but it's a problem in other areas. Um, for example, in quantum gravity, which is something that I've been working on for a while, y you have some people who do uh, the theory stuff, and they do theory stuff. You know, they calculate. Mm -hmm. They have no idea what you can measure or how you can measure it. Uh, you know, and, and on the other side, you have experimentalists who, who who don't know what to do with the theories because there are no predictions coming out. So you have basically this complete disconnect between them. Interesting. <laughs> And you you also I think I'm getting there, but you also talked about there's uh, there's the the cultural and uh, sociological reason why when you get these these people together and when they're working on these short per term contracts as you've talked about and you have to find money uh, it the the, uh, the forces that push that into a stable condition 
uh, cause people you know, to do the same thing as everybody else is doing. So it's hard to find people who think uh, laterally or any differently or something. You just have more and more people who write papers about the same thing and reference each other, it seems like, so they can keep their funding and keep going and keep their tenure and and move along. And that's, so you're feeling that there's, you were describing something sounds like an institutional problem as well. Yes, that, that institutional problem definitely exists. Uh, it's not specific to physics by any nope. means. Nope. Uh, it's nope. It's been discussed a lot by other people. You see the same thing in the life science. You, yep. you yeah, t tell me something about it. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I'm just, I'm totally in agreement that, uh, yeah, you, you are continually uh, rewarded for being a part of what's already happening. Mm -hmm. Like right, your, exactly. your new ideas, it's harder to get money for. You don't get promoted in your, you know, in academia for having something new that's not getting money. <clears throat> so, yeah, I think it's, it's, every every field of science is, I think, suffering from this right now. Right, and there are other problems that play into this. It's it's not only that new fields are, are problematic; it's also that joining a large field uh, has benefit because the mm -hmm. larger the field, the more important it looks. Um, you know, because mm -hmm. it attracts people and then it attracts funding. And if it attracts mm -hmm. funding, it attracts more people. And uh, so you can basically create those the, those research bubbles, uh, which can be pretty impossible to kill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, never mind that there's nothing coming out of those bubbles. And then there's also the problem that it is, um, at, at least in the fields that I'm uh, writing about, it is really hard to get out of the research area uh, once you have, uh, you know, done your first, second postdoc on it, you're pretty much stuck there yes. because uh, no one will hire you to work on something else. So, so what if you've spent the last 10 years working on supersymmetry and then you decided that's not, you know, I don't believe in that anymore. You have no choice. You know, you, you will end up having to tell everyone that supersymmetry is the greatest thing and, and certainly we'll soon see it. And if not at this collider, then please give us money for the next collider because otherwise you're out of a job. So where can we look? Where where can new ideas come from? Are we past the days of, of you know, romantic notions of patent clerks having ideas in the night as they ponder their navels? Well, that's an interesting question. So uh, one thing that I've noticed is that. Um, there are actually some people who leave academia but continue to do research on the side and that seems to become a thing. There are some people who call this LTX, like alternative academics or something. Right. I, find it, I find this a super terrible acronym, but yeah. <laughs> so that's what I've heard them call it. I, I've, I've called it the academic underground. Yes. But um, this is certainly something that we're seeing because a lot of people are really dissatisfied with the pressures that academia puts on you. And I can understand this very well. I don't really think that this will actually solve the problem because there are just not sufficiently many people. There's not enough funding. And yeah. this is maybe something that you can do in some areas. Like if, if you want to do your calculation on, I don't know what your, your great theory of everything. But the moment that it comes to something where you actually need money, like you want to do some experiment mm -hmm. it's not going to work mm -hmm. uh, how's that where's the money supposed to come from unless you're uh, right? an eccentric millionaire already <laughs> yeah <laughs> right uh, unless you have uh, yeah and of course there are there are all, uh, private investors uh, who may play a role and and uh, yeah so i i I don't really see that solving the problem either. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I mean, I, I kind of, I hope that uh, there is a solution in front of us because I don't think that all those people who, who uh, are working in the fields right now actually want to do what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think, uh, and uh, this is not just guessing. I actually 10 years ago made a, made a survey which the result of which never were published because uh, I'm a terrible person. And so you have to take my <laughs> word on that. So I made a survey among, um, that was 2008, um, among um, physicists um, in the United States and Canada. And we got a pretty good response rate um, that was um, at least statistically um, um, representative of, of the whole field. And we asked them, uh, like, if you could, you know, if you had no financial problems and nothing to worry about with your collaborators, would you change the topic that you're working on? Mm -hmm. 
And there's a ridiculously high amount of people who's like almost one half who would say, if I could, I would do something else. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really, really scary because it tells you that uh, those people really just do what they're doing because it's what they can get funding for. And, and that's not a good situation. So if people ask you about how to try to change the situation, this is something that you would identify as a sort of uh, what central pivot, something that holds things that if you could find the way, and this, this is true in other economic things. This is why we talk about uh, universal healthcare and things. And people point out that this leaves people freer to change their minds, to try something new, to be entrepreneurial, to do something fresh rather than doing the same thing they're doing because it's what pays the bills. So if we can find a way then for a scientist to do something new without the hmm, burdensome punishments of changing uh, and provide ways to change so that you're not forced to do what your resume has, perhaps this would be uh, hmm, a beautiful theory that would give us more emergent <laughs> properties than just uh, allowing people to change jobs. It sounds like it's a central a central point that that everything uh, holds holds all this together. Yes, I I do think that there's a huge amount of money that is being wasted um, because people just work on what everyone works on because that's the only thing that they can get paid to work on. It the whole thing just doesn't make any sense. But how to stop that? Because the people yeah, who are that, that's the distributing thing, the money, the people who are distributing the money don't know how to evaluate proposals except to choose ones mm -hmm. that look like what everybody else is doing that will be successful. They're, they're as locked in, aren't they, as the researchers? Oh. You know, I want to, I want to ask something, uh, speaking of maybe wasting money, maybe not. So I guess um, there's the potential that China may build a large, giant, giant super circular collider, right? So since they're investing in science and things like that. And I, I even heard, I had spoken to a Chinese student uh, who had said Lisa Randall had come to his university in November and she says, yeah, China, we're counting on you to build the collider, this new big giant collider. And then, and then I, it, there was um, a physicist who, from, who won a Nobel Prize back in the 50s, Chinese physicist, Qin Nen Yang, I got his name wrong, I'm sure. But he, he's actually spoken out critically against, we shouldn't build this giant circular collider. And it, he didn't say that it won't work, but he just said, wow, all the money spent on that, if you could funnel that to biomedical research, that might do more good. So this is not exactly what you talk about in the book, but you do have some arguments against building yet another collider that may or may not find something. So. Yes. So in the book, I don't actually say a lot about uh, building colliders or not right. uh, building colliders. Uh, I, you know, if one person says, uh, let, let us not fund this collider, but let us put more money into bio research. Okay. So that that's one person with an opinion, um, a Nobel Prize or not. I'm not sure uh, how seriously to take that. Yeah. Um, if you want, I can tell you why I'm not a fan of uh, uh, building I, a larger collider. Yeah, I'm <laughs> interested. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, um, so uh, we already talked about uh, the problems with the um, theory development in that field, which has been strongly guided uh, by those beauty considerations. And um, I think this is the reason why we have seen this long string of null results. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of people in those disciplines who will tell you that, well, that's not our fault, that's nature's fault, right? We've made those experiments uh, and, and nothing came out of it. And now we'll just keep on doing experiments. But I, th I think that after some decades of this, um, you, you have to start asking that maybe we're not doing the right experiments. Right. <laughs> maybe we should be doing something else. And it's this, this change of a mindset uh, that is not happening because people in those communities have no, um, there's no self-reflection going on. You know, they, they just don't want to admit that there might be possibly something not working out. Mm -hmm. um, so, and this has left us in a situation where right now we do not have any good predictions for a new phenomena to find at a larger collider. 
Um, this means um, most likely what it will do is it will uh, measure more precisely the properties of particles in the standard model, which is not uninteresting by no means, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not something that will um, help you with developing the new theory. It's basically more null results. And um, so that's one thing. It's not terribly promising if um, you want to finally make some breakthroughs in the foundations. The other thing is that for what experiments are concerned, it, colliders are really, really expensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the, even the cheaper version of, of those larger colliders comes in at something like 10 billion, uh, and then the full version is something like 21. Um, uh, if you compare that to the, the typical other experiments that are being made in the foundations, uh, where you do some high precision measurements or you build telescopes, something that that's something like between half a billion or maybe one, two billion, something in that ballpark. So it's definitely very expensive. And then you have this issue that really, when it comes to collider technology, there is not a lot of new stuff that has come into play since the 1990s. Um, mm -hmm. Even though at, at current, there are some um, potentially important things in the work, um, like, for example, the, uh, the plasma wake field uh, acceleration. Um, I can tell you a little bit about this uh, if you want to hear. So this is a new method of accelerating uh, particles, basically, that uh, would help you, if it works, uh, to do uh, mm -hmm. this acceleration on much shorter distances. Mm. And there's also um, the high temperature superconductors that every couple of weeks there's some headlines about it. So um, these are still not on a level where you could actually um, use them for the magnets. Uh, but maybe there will be something happening in, in the next one, two decades. And so now, you know, imagine they, they dig this tunnel, which is 100 kilometer long. Now you have your ring and, and then the people with the wake field accelerator come and say, oh, that, that's all well and fine. But now we can do the same thing in 50 meters. So uh, that would be looking pretty stupid, right? So uh, I don't think that's, um, I don't think it's a good moment in time um, to make an investment like this. It doesn't make any sense. Is this just the, the feeling of despair and nihilism that comes before a big paradigm shift? <laughs> well, that, that sounds very helpful. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm, what I'm afraid of is that they will build this larger collider and we will wait 30 years and we will get further null results and nothing will change. We'll get some really so, good so bounds. We'll get some good bounds out. Of yeah, it. good, good bounds. Interesting <laughs> bounds. Uh, yeah. and, and newly amended theories and new arguments for why we need the next uh, larger collider. Yeah. Um, it, it is, you know, if I think, you know, that, that those are so many so smart people. You know, if they would just switch on their brain, <laughs> I'm pretty sure we would see a paradigm change, I don't know, in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I think it must be there already somewhere in the literature, but mm -hmm. no one's taking it serious because, uh, I don't know, it has not been cited often enough, so they all think there must be something fishy about it, but no one actually wants to spend the time and, and read the damn paper. <laughs> and so so th these are the things that keep me up at night. Right? Well, is this like the, the way... Uh the way that social media exists now is like you can't make any, uh, you become a celebrity if you get the right person to tweet you because then they get retweeted by the right people. And as long as you can work your way up the chain to a million retweets, uh, you become an instant celebrity. Is this the case where there's the paper with the bright idea, but you have to get Steve Weinberg to draw people's attention to it before uh, everyone then decides that it's interesting? Uh, there are certainly parallels. I would not, I wouldn't say that it's, quite as bad you know there there are still i mean uh, quality still matters uh it's not totally irrelevant i think that will be pushing it too far uh, mm -hmm. but there's we certainly see some of the same dynamics and it's not all that um surprising because it's basically the same underlying structure that that feeds mm -hmm. this cycle right so if if you're popular you become more popular it's it's a rich get richer poor get poorer mm -hmm. trend and there's the, there's the meritocracy notion that if you write the paper that has a beautiful idea in it, people will see it and will come and, and bow before you. And I think I succumbed to that a long time ago. It's like, no, you write the paper and then you spend the rest of your life promoting it if you have the faith in it in order to try to get it to, uh, you know, above, above the surface of the water so that it can breathe. Uh, I don't know. That's awfully hard to do with all these these string theorists over here talking to each other. 
uh, and not paying any attention to anything else. Yeah, as we, we see this uh, with uh, dark matter. Um, so yes. this is something that I um, touch on in the book only very briefly. Uh, I, I simply didn't have the space. And then I took what the, the stuff that I cut out and exported this into an article that uh, I wrote with uh, Stacey McGaugh for Scientific American last year, uh -huh. where, where I go on a little bit about this. But um, there you, you very strongly see these uh, sociological trends. Mm -hmm. I was just, just last week on a on a workshop uh, where about dark matter versus modified gravity, mm -hmm. where uh, this came up uh, repeatedly. Um, it's just you have this you have this really large community of people who work on particle dark matter, and they are very certain of themselves because they have this large community behind them, yes. and they're sh they're sure they can fit everything, uh, you know. And and then there are those people who do modified gravity. And they're like, yeah, but look, we can do the galaxies better. And they're like, la, 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 I can't hear you, yes. basically. Uh, and, and it's been going on for 20 years. It's really depressing if you look at the data. Yeah. And yet sometimes these things shift. It can happen, I think, can it? But what causes it to happen? How do you make it happen? And where is the, uh, as you were talking, I was wondering, where is the public in this? Are they interested yet in dark matter or they say, oh, dark matter is just something that some people made up and it's not a real thing. Does that, uh, that sort of averaged big opinion of the public and their interest have something to do with moving the center of gravity of, of, uh, of belief and fashion in the physics world? Well, I do think the public should have a general interest in science working properly, uh, not only in physics, but also in biomedicine or mm -hmm. in uh, economics or what have you. And as long as you have a system that uh, rewards people for working on what is popular and what produces papers quickly, um, yeah. that's just not happening. It's a huge waste of taxpayers' money. And so I think the public should have an interest in, in, in changing this. Um, so, so this is what the general overarching theme is concerned. When it comes to uh, physics uh, in particular, um, there have been a lot of um, news stories and also magazine articles about all the great things that the Large Hadron Collider was supposed to find uh, that never came into being. Mm -hmm. it, it may still happen, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, So the second round completed in uh, November or early December, something like this. And uh, I'm guessing they're analyzing the data as we speak. Mm -hmm. and, and we will probably start hearing rumors in the next couple of weeks and then maybe some tentative first results in March. So um, if they find something, then, then everything will be fine. You know, everything will be great and they have the supersymmetric particles. Um, if they don't find anything new, except for some statistical fluctuations, which they always see, mm. um, you know, if, if I would feel pretty cheated on <laughs> if uh, I had actually believed what those scientists told me. Yeah. Um, and um, still, uh, even today, there have not been any physicists who actually made an effort and tried to correct this. You know, there have been a lot of people mm -hmm. who made these big proclamations. I've collected all the references on, on my blog, if anyone is interested. Um, pr pretty big statements um, that the Large Hadron Collider, you know, there, there were predictions that those particles yeah. wouldn't be seen. They should actually have been seen very early, already in the first run. And now it's basically like no one wants to have said it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so th those people have gone totally quiet there's there's nothing coming out there except for one guy who who uh, you know is now banging the drum for the next larger collider <laughs> yes. yeah we'll, you know we'll put that link below the video so if yeah. people are watching we, they can get to your to your blog um, it's interesting how you know Jeff you were talking about uh, the general public and popularizing science and I noticed yeah you, Davina, got, you oh. put you put a couple of uh, popularizers in your book they are bona fide scientists, but they're also strong popularizers. You've got Katie Mack and Chad Orzel, who's actually been on our show before. Yep. Um, I thought that was a good move, especially for um, a book that's aiming towards the general public, you know, to get some sh also straight, other straightforward uh, explanator, ex explanations, <laughs> explainers. 
I was thinking of a word, <laughs> you know, and, and so I thought, I thought that was great. It makes me, oh, we, Jeff and I sort of have a game. How many other guests yes. have appeared in everybody else's books? <laughs> <laughs> well, so one. Uh, this, this has held so far for, uh, for like the last two thirds, for like the last five years, every book we read now has to reference somebody that we've already talked to. <laughs> Uh, and it happened. It was it was a delight that it was Chad Orzel this time because he's that's this his first uh, mention now a new. But uh, that was fun to see him. <coughs> but he, he also he also has a new book which uh, yeah I'm um, I still want to review it on my blog but I haven't come around right and which we haven't read yet. But, uh, <laughs> Joanne, my what what do you say, Joanne, about the attention of the public because your sphere of things now has some stuff that's got people pretty excited with, you know, designer babies and CRISPR technology and everything that's going to happen sooner than fusion reactors. Right. Uh, well, and it, people are help? more interested in themselves most of the time. So yeah. how's this going to affect my health? How, this, how will this affect my children and things like that? So I think, you know, biomedical certainly has, has more of a draw yeah. Uh, in that it's practical. And whereas, you know, when we're talking here about particles, you know, dark matter, dark energy, like you said, Jeff, it's like, what does this have to do with me in my daily life? Yeah. You know, Except so, it's, but it's, it's important that it is interesting. And that yeah. I think that's, you know, what's a, a good thing for scientists to do is sort of say, hey, this is interesting. We don't know if we'll be able to figure this out anytime soon, but yeah. You know, I think it, it's sort of the big, it. everybody loves dinosaurs and most people like astrophysics. And, and the weather. Yeah, the weather. And and <laughs> in in the uh, cosmology, uh, dark, dark matter and dark energy together, but dark matter is like, it's the huge WTF moment. It's like, wait, what do you mean? There's all this stuff we can't see and it's 85% of the universe. How can that, how can that be? That's, right. That just messes with people's minds. Well, people uh, like big black holes. They like black people holes. love black holes. <laughs> boy, boy. And wait till they hear about firewalls. Yeah, I was <laughs> interested to read, to read about about that in Sabina's book too. So I don't know, is, is public interest a, both a boon and a burden? Yeah. It's certainly something that I think uh, sh scientists should think more about how they deal with it. Um, so generally, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, I, I think it's a positive thing. Mm. Um, if people hear about uh, what scientists are doing, also how they're doing it. Uh, and also, of course, I think that what, what we're doing is exciting. So um, I, I, I hope that other people uh, will get inspired by it. Um, but there's also a risk that comes with it uh, with that I think a lot of, um, at, at least in my community, uh, scientists are not um, aware of, which is how this hype in the media of certain topics really affects the way that you think about your own research area. And um, this is something that uh, I have to admit is something that, that, that greatly influenced me. I think that the, the major reason that I originally bought those stories about what the Large Hadron Collider is going to find you know, with the black holes, and this is what I wrote my PhD on, is that it was very present in the media. This is mm -hmm. how I first learned of it was, believe that or not, in Scientific American, mm -hmm. because I was actually uh, working on something entirely different at the time. And um, so, so actually, I didn't even see it, but uh, my, my supervisor did and put me the Scientific American article on my desk. And this, so this is how I ended up working on it. Um, uh, but there's also there have been a lot of articles about it and, and it makes you feel very comfortable about what you're working on, right? Mm. Because it looks important. Uh, people ask you about it. Mm -hmm. They can understand um, what and, you're and, saying. Yeah, and, and so that plays a role. And, and that's certainly not something that is specific to high energy particle physics, but I guess that also plays a role in other disciplines. And there's, there isn't a priori anything wrong with that. I just think that people should keep this in mind, how it affects um, the assessment of the relevance of what they're doing. In particular, if you look at this, this hype that we have seen about those new things that the Large Hadron Collider um, should mm -hmm. find, 
it takes an enormous confidence for a scientist to make such statements mm -hmm. uh, in, in a public audience as uh, statements that are now clearly obviously uh, wrong. And uh, I, I think the only reason that something like this can happen is that they feel like they have the backup of their whole community mm -hmm. and no one ever disagreed with them. And then they make those statements and it feeds back into this community. Um, and, and so th this uh, leads, leads to this um, uh, cycle in which uh, people basically tell themselves that they're, they're doing the right thing. And, and now everyone, so they can't believe that something possibly w went wrong. <laughs> like, yes. <so> they, <laughs> Fortunately, the public has a short memory, it seems, too. But I want, I want to yeah, ask one different that. thing before we get too close to the end, because one of the things... Uh, this is part of my, you know, to convince people to read your book, which is something we'd like to do here. Uh, I found it very engaging for all the things that we've talked about, the ideas, they're all packed in there. There's a huge number of ideas, but it also did a very nice job. It felt like you, we could see that you were interviewing all these people. You were talking to physicists about getting to the root of these questions and, and new ideas that came along as you peeled back layers on trying to understand this. But there was enough a personal thing. It was not just interviews for data, but it was interviews as part of the narrative of how you were telling the story. And it seemed very engaging. It seemed very much like a personal discovery, like when you started. And I don't know whether you did that as you were writing the book or whether that's the way you've written the book, but it felt like you didn't really know where the book would end when you started. And it felt very much like a quest story to me that I found very engaging. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. Um, I so I've been. I actually I I just wrote a a, a blog post uh, which is titled "Maybe I'm Crazy," <laughs> because uh, it it seems so strange to me. Like, why do I not understand what those people are talking about? Why do they take these arguments from beauty so seriously? So I went around and I talked to them. Uh, you know, maybe they would have brought up a reason that uh, would have explained it. Uh, but I, I mean, I ended up not finding those arguments uh, too convincing. Mm -hmm. um, there was also the thing with the with the dye photo anomaly, right? Yep. Yeah, I yeah. mean, if this if this had not vanished, that would have been an entirely different story. Yes, yes, uh, that that does happen, and sometimes things do not vanish, and things do change, uh, but we can't predict when they happen, as far as I can tell. Yeah, right. But we so, just uh, wait. We just wait for, <laughs> for something exciting to to happen and, and throw things into turmoil. And and suddenly uh, it's a uh, what's one of these tipping tipping events where it suddenly changes the flow of money and interest and things and everyone runs over there uh, and does that. But it can make new things happen and new ideas come along. And it also gives us posters of Einstein to hang on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Sabina, does, you know, writing a book like this is a little controversial because you really are butting heads with a big monster institution of academia and of science and things like that. So how has that uh, changed anything for you? Have you, have, you know, have you just sort of said, well, no, I'll keep uh, announcing to the world that science needs to change? Or have you thought, okay, maybe I should back off? I mean, oh. What, what's happening since the publication of your book? I mean, I know you've been writing blogs for a while. Uh, I, I kind of feel like the only thing I've done in the last three months is giving interviews. Uh, <laughs> so it, it definitely takes a lot of time away from my research. I will admit that I don't specifically enjoy it. Uh, that's, you know, don't take it personally. No, no. But no. I, I've been repeating the same thing over and over and over and over again, uh, even though that's a story that for me happened three years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrote the book and then I handed in the manuscript and for me, the thing was done. But uh, now <laughs> everyone is there like two years later and wants to talk to me about it yes. <laughs> uh, while I'm trying to do something else. So that's a little bit weird. Uh, but um, yeah, no, I mean, I started this now. I, I have to uh, get along with it. As to the content, to me, that's not really something new. This is something that I've been writing about on my blog for 10 years or something. Um, and I've always gotten uh, some rather annoyed feedback on, mm -hmm. on certain things. And now I get more of this. <laughs> so I, far, I'm coping. <laughs> I, jo Joanne and I have read some things that are purposely controversial. 
and they're just irritating. So I would mean this as as a, a kind thing to say. It's like I felt like this was uh, there was more a discussion and examination and, and discovery of many many interesting ideas that happened to come with some controversy or a lot of controversy around them. It didn't feel intentionally confrontational, nor did it feel uh, like you were trying to hide things to avoid controversy. So I enjoyed the the discussion and the and what you related about these conversations as you tried to get physicists to explain something that I don't know must come almost with mother's milk, uh, and and uh, they don't even understand. I think why you're asking. You're a, you're a physicist. Why are you asking what beauty means? What do you, what do you even mean? Uh, it should be obvious to you, and. And it was very hard to get at them. Occasionally, you did. There was some some keen insight into that, but I don't well, know. Well, and I, I think she, you know, you have a lot of great things to say about um, just how science is working in general. Yeah. You know um, how there needs to be a closer combination of the scientific method with some philosophy, some reflection, and and yes, and to stop following like lemmings. This is the hot topic. Okay, everybody, let's talk about the microbiome and CRISPR, and you know that's that's in biology. But you know, um, I, I, you make excellent points about the state of science at, as it is now and has been going on for many decades. So um, I appreciate that. Uh, it's eye opening to that someone's written a book that is that is openly saying this. The, this is an issue. Well, thank you. Believe that or not, I actually don't think it's all that controversial what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, I, I'm just I saying that. True. Uh, I, I think it might be people might be like uncomfortable reading if they're in science, or they may go. But I right, know that, that. that's 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 the reason why uh, people take offense in it. They they think I shouldn't yeah. say it in public. That's the yes. issue. and mm -hmm. I probably agree with you more than disagree, and so I didn't find it particularly controversial, but. I guess I can see, and I, I think I have one thing because it's not very often that I'm reading, and I I read this paragraph and I said, "Well, this is my favorite paragraph in the book." It doesn't <laughs> usually happen, but you were talking about uh, the research of Garrett. Is it Lisi? Yeah. yeah. And who is a very peculiar uh, surfing bum in Hawaii who also does who also does particle theory with big Lie algebras and things like that, which is a peculiar notion to think about. And you're talking about these exceptional Lie groups, which are not like all of the normal infinite number of Lie groups over here, but then there are these three over here that are Lie groups, but they're peculiar. And it's like, how to get that across? So I'm gonna to read, to appreciate how bizarre this is, you wrote, imagine you visit a website where you can order door signs with the numbers one, two, three, four, and so on, all the way up to infinity. Then you can also order an emu, an empty bottle, and an Eiffel Tower. That's how awkwardly the exceptional league groups sit beside the orderly infinite families. I enjoyed that so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to hear. You would not believe how long I have doctored on that paragraph. <laughs> it, was it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, um, we're coming up at the end of the hour. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Sabina, that uh, maybe we forgot to ask uh, that you wanted uh, to highlight? Well, no. well, well, thanks for having me. I appreciate your interest in the book. Yeah, no, it was just such, such a pleasant surprise because a book that says math on the front maybe will not pull me in right <laughs> away. And luckily I had some other people who wisely read the book and recommended it. And uh, yeah, so that, you know, that was fantastic for me. So I'm doing the same for all of you. So even if you were not leaning towards a book about uh, beauty in physics and, and how math plays in, a role in it, um, I am recommending to read uh, that you go ahead and check out Lost in Math by Sabina Hassenfelder. Very good. Do you think you'll write another book? <laughs> yes, yes, I will write another book. <laughs> At some point, okay. <laughs> well, I will be keeping my eyes out for it because I, I really like this book. Um, there's there's a good sense of humor in it as well as uh, important information mm -hmm. about the state of science. Anything else you want to add, Jeff? No, no, I enjoyed the book very much. All of the ideas and the, the quest of discovery that I felt you were taking us on. And so I would also recommend the book. Thanks very much for talking with us, Sabine. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, and thanks everybody for joining us. And we'll see you again next time on Read Science. Bye.